Welcome to the Bike Talk with Dave podcast. I'm your host, Dave Mabel. Thanks for tuning in. This week, we're talking with Ian Boswell, a former member of the Team Sky World Tour team, who is now the host of the fine podcast, Breakfast with Boz. And he has continued to fuel his competitive fire racing gravel here in the United States. But that was not his intention. When he retired from professional road racing, he just came back to the U.S., bought a home in Vermont with his beautiful bride, fed the animals, tended the garden, and kept a foot in the bike racing door working at Wahoo. Interestingly, his work at Wahoo took him to some of the biggest gravel races in the country. So he decided to bring a bike, and after a victory at Unbound, it seemed pretty apparent that he had not lost his touch. Today he continues to race his bike at some of his favorite places, one of which is in Heiko, Texas, at the Gravel Locos. Now I had Fabian Saralta, director of the race, on this podcast about a year ago, and it seems like he puts on a great participant-centered event. So I wanted to talk with Ian about his connection to Gravel Locos and ask him what makes it a special race on his calendar. So settle in and enjoy this conversation with Ian Boswell. Uh, Ian Boswell, welcome to Bike Talk with Dave. What a treat to have you on and what a treat to have you in my ears and I can actually look at you. I'm a fan of your podcast as well as your accomplishments on the bike. So welcome to Bike Talk with Dave. Oh, thanks for having me, Dave. I feel like sometimes when you speak to fellow podcasters, it's uh, it's made easy because you understand that it's important to keep talking on a podcast. You can't just stop and pan to some nice views for 30 seconds. True that. So can I just say on your market set, go and you'll fill in an hour of great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, starting at birth until now. Yep. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, well, I, I do want to talk about your podcast. Uh, I want to talk about where you were. You've got actually... I don't know, several chapters of your book we could talk about. Uh, one of the things I want to focus on is your uh, relationship with Gravel Locos. Uh, Fabian was on the podcast last year, the director of the race, and uh, gave you credit for helping Gravel Locos uh, kind of get on the map. So I want to talk about that. And I know you and Emily Newsom just did a, a shindig down in Texas maybe two weeks ago, a week and a half ago or so. Yeah. Are you back in Vermont? I am back in Vermont, back in the snow and cold. And uh, yeah, came home with a, a bit of a knee injury as well. I did too much riding down there. Nothing, nothing major. I mean, when, when endurance athletes complain about knee injuries, it's not like I, I'm, you know, disabled, not able to walk around, but you know, I, I definitely haven't been uh, riding as much as I would have hoped to coming home from a big training block, just a little, a little nagging pain in my knee, but um, to be expected when you get overly excited and go do 450 miles in five days or something like that. Uh, that's, yeah, that's legit miles right there. Um, good to get back to the snow. It is. Well, I mean, part of the reason I went down to Texas was one, um, one was the weather here in Vermont. Like if we have snow on the ground, I actually don't mind it. You know, I can ski, I can fat bike, you know, it, it, if it's cold and frozen, I'm fine. Um, yep. but, you know, we've had this like pretty miserable winter where it's like, we get snow and then it rains and it all melts and it's just muddy and wet. And it's like, you can't ski. It's too cold to bike. Um, I mean, it's too, it's almost too cold and too warm to bike. Like it's too cold in the sense like you can't go on the roads because they're all, you know, wet and you just get like spray, but it's too warm because you can't fat bike on the frozen, you know, frozen roads or trails because you know, it's, it's muddy. It's like, I don't mind riding if it's below 26, I can ride my fat bike or if it's like above 35, I can ride, you know, the roads, but it's like just been hovering in this no man's land of, uh, you know, weather. Uh, yeah, that's too bad. That was, that's like mud season in Colorado. Like you can't yeah. ski and you can't go out and play. The trails aren't clear, but they're not good. It's just there. So I bet Texas was nice. It was. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was, it was a good block of, of riding. Um, you know, another thing that's just like so fun to do is like, you know, we oftentimes go, or I oftentimes go to these events that, you know, you're there for a couple of days, like maybe you do a recon ride, a short shakeout ride, the race, and you go home. So you see a very small part of the the network of roads. Um, 
and I was blown away by the writing in Heiko. Like, I mean, I, I kind of just scratched the surface and I was like, whoa, this is like one of, you know, I told this to, to Fabi and I was like, this is one of the coolest places, especially this time of year. You know, it's not too hot. Um, you know, it was dry. Um, I'm sure it's different if you go there in August and it's 115 degrees. But for Correct. the time of the year I went, I was like, this is one of the best spots I've ever, you know, gone for like just a place to go ride your bike and explore. Um, phenomenal roads and tons of roads out there. A lot of gravel? All gravel, yeah. I mean, All pretty, gravel. I jumped on some some ro- you know little paved roads here and there, but um, yeah, it, it. I mean, just a a maze of you know roads out there in the in the ranch lands. Huh. It's um. I have a son who lives in Austin, just north of Austin, and um, we went down there. We went down for the rattlesnake gravel grind, um, last March, and we obviously we had our bikes, but we went to our son's house for a couple of days before and we rode north of Austin and it was all chip seal, all macadam. I, we didn't find mm-hmm. any gravel at all. Um, and Heiko's not that much further north, maybe another half hour, 45 minutes further north from where we were in, in uh, Briggs. But uh, uh, we might venture up there next time we're down. Definitely a spot to check out. Yeah. And really quiet roads as well. Um, you know, there the, the handful of, you know, ranchers I saw out there, super, you know, oftentimes you're in Texas, you see a big truck, you're like, oh boy, I'm about to get run off the road, but everyone was right. waving. I think they're just like surprised to see someone out there in, you know, late December, early January riding the bike. You know, they think it's all cold, you know, it's 65 degrees and everyone in Texas right. is bundled up in puffy jackets. Um, but yeah, really, really great riding. And like I said, just, you know, kind of endless, endless roads to ride and explore. Yeah, well, I'll uh, I'll look forward to uh, going a little further north and looking to get on some gravel. Yeah. So I want to talk about you in case somebody doesn't know you. Uh, talked about your podcast, Breakfast with Boz. Um, I want to ask you about the origin of that, but I want to first paint a little picture of of your riding experience because you have a, a bit of a unique experience. You're not, I wouldn't call you old. You're not like a forty five year old ex world tour guy you're like a 33 year old ex world tour guy and um i don't call 33 old i feel um, i feel it every day i feel like that 45 oh, year it. old <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that i just was talking to i don't know if you know matt zimmer uh project yeah. echelon dude and uh, he was joking he's like yeah they put me on the team again another year i don't know why they keep me around i'm so old and i'm like dude yeah. you're not old yeah you're like 30 he's barely 30 he's not old you guys are not old that being said when the dudes who are winning the tour of france are like 12 or so um 30 something must must feel kind of old um but i want to go back a uh well, a dozen years now it's 2024 you you got second place in Liège Baston Liège in the U23 race. Holy smokes, what was that like? That's that's not just one of the classics. That's like one of the classics. That's a great race. Yeah, I mean it, it's a race that I I always loved. I mean, I think Liège uh is still one I mean it's still a monument. You know, there's what For there's sure. five monuments in in the world of of kind of one day races. Um I think it's kind of slowly lost some of its, I don't want to say prestige, but, you know, there has been so much emphasis on Tour of Flanders and Roubaix and, you know, I guess even like Milan San Remo. Um, but Liège is kind of always, I mean, I'm not someone who loves cobblestones and, and riding in, in Belgium, um, you know, crosswinds and all that. You know, Liège was kind of the race that was, I guess, growing up that I always like aspired to be like, oh, that's a race I would love to, to you know, do or win or, you know, I guess you kind of don't really know what you're capable of until you get older. But I guess in my in my youth, there was also a lot of, you know, American riders that were, you know, we had this whole generation of American GC riders, you know, Tyler Hamilton and Lance, you know, they were all, they were all oftentimes competitive in, in Liège, you know, Hamilton won that race and goodness, I don't know, 2004 or something, 2001, something like something, that. Yep. Some, sometime around then. Um, and so those were kind of the riders that I, you know, even if they were foreign riders, like that I looked up to was, you know, kind of these climbing GC riders and they weren't oftentimes back in the day, they weren't pogachar they weren't racing flanders and roubaix um so you kind of i kind of like focused and you know 
watch those races, you know, the Ardennes classics a bit more than I watched, you know, the, the Flemish classics, you know, it was never going to be a, a Tom Boonen or a Wout Van Aert. Um, so it was just a race that was a bit more, yeah, a bit more mystical to me. I also I actually also spent my junior year of high school in Belgium living in the French speaking part. Um, so I could actually, I couldn't ride, well, I could have ridden to Liège, it wasn't terribly close, but, you know, kind of, I knew the the Ardennes fairly well, um, and just a, a place that I kind of always, yeah, enjoyed riding and racing. Do you remember how that race played out? How did you ended up standing on that podium? Yeah, it's actually a good story. So there was an early, early breakaway, you know, oftentimes U23 races, there's not a ton of organization, you know, it's not like a, a team goes to the front and, you know, lets a breakaway go and then chases it down. But an early break when I think of like five or six riders um, and Michael Valgren went up the road in that breakaway who, you know, is a pro rider on, on EF. Um, what are they? EF education, easy post now. Um, sure. I think, I think that's what they're called. I think but, that's right. Um, anyway, so he had gone up the road um, in this breakaway and I think they had a pretty big, gap i mean at some point it probably went up to six minutes and um you say yeah, they so you weren't in it i wasn't in it no i was back in the bunch and then probably like 40 40 k to go or something we had to hit this you know kind of coming back into liege hit hit a series of climbs and i was like well this gap isn't coming down i need to i need to go now um so i went and actually another american josh barry who was a strong racer at the time came with me and i think another maybe a, a french rider as well um and we started closing the gap, just the three of us. And the, the Peloton was still pretty big and eventually, you know, got close. And unlike the pro Liège, the under 23 Liège, like the old finish, you go over the, I guess it's the Cote d'Anse is the last climb. And the old one, they went up and then they turned left. I think where um, Dan Martin crashed one time, like in that final left-hand turn before the finish. So the under 23 goes over the top of that climb and then actually goes down and finishes in a velodrome, an outdoor velodrome. Oh, cool. And so I dropped everyone who had come with me, you know, caught everyone in the breakaway, but Valgren and hit that last top of that last climb. I think it was like a 10 or 15 second gap. You know, you come into the velodrome like Roubaix and you do, you know, you come in halfway. So you do a full lap and then half lap to the finish. And uh, I could see, I like literally by the finish, it was like a five second gap. You know, I was like, oh no, I almost caught him, but he's a, he's a worthy winner. I think he actually wound up winning it. Maybe he had won the year before he won the year after as well. Um, you know, but he's gone on. He won Amstel Gold Race as a as a pro. So you know, uh, yeah, a, a good second place behind a you know a pretty you know respected rider. Yeah, for sure. What was your best finish after that in the um, once you jumped into the World Tour level? <sighs> oh, I couldn't even tell you. I'd maybe inside the top hundred. <laughs> um, I think. I, well, I, I saw in um, did it, but. you were on Team Sky, and I saw in 2016 while Poles won. Did you yeah. play a part in his victory? I wasn't. I mean, there other that than year. towing him basically to the line. I'm yeah, sure. no, I didn't. I don't think I did it that year, if I recall. Um, it may, I may have. I don't know where I was. Um, I did it a couple times. I think a couple times with Sky. I did it with Katusha as well. Mm. Um, but you know, it, it's a different game, and you know, you're also playing you know a different role. You know, in, in the under twenty three category at the time, you know, I had kind of the freedom to to race for myself and go after results. And by the time I was in the World Tour, you know what? Like I said, whether it was Walt Powell's or, you know, Bradley Wiggins, I think I did it the first year as a pro. And I think we had Rigoberto or Ron there and Richie Port. And it's like, those guys are much bigger riders than me. I can <laughs> do what I can to help them. <laughs> I'll bring them a, I'll bring them a, a granola bar now and again. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. So I got to ask you about this. Uh, 2016 Vuelta a España and you were on the team that got first on the first stage in a team time trial. Mm -hmm. Do you guys like draw straws? Who gets to wear the red jersey? No, it's something, I mean, and team time trials are such a logistical like fiasco. You know, there's so much preparation, especially, you know, that, that addition, you know, is the first stage, you know, so you're in, we're in Spain, you know, I don't know, a week beforehand, you know, training recon in the course you know doing tt you know or i guess ttt practice you know team time trial practice um and you know i think frumi had come off the tour that year i think he had won the tour you know so he was like you know in the training rides he was tired or he had to do something and you're just trying to like get the team to mesh um you know and eventually like things start kind of clicking and you figure out 
you know, rotation and order and the bunch and kind of figuring out the course, like the last thing you kind of discuss is who's going to, if, if we're in a position to win, who's going to cross the line first. Um, you know, oftentimes there's kind of a clear hierarchy, you know, and I guess it's different being the first stage because whoever wins takes the red Jersey, you know, if For it's sure. stage six and you know, whoever crosses the line, then time you know, matters, but yeah. And exactly. and the first stage, that's why I'm asking. Cause it's unique. It's weird. It's like, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, you, it's something that was never discussed ahead of time. And, you know, Pete Kenna wound up taking the red Jersey and, you know, he was like a, a worthy winner. And, you know, I think in a situation like that, it's probably good for, you know, Froomey, who was the, the leader overall to like allow another rider on the team to take the red Jersey. Cause it's, you know, one of the biggest achievements of, you know, Pete's career. And yet for Froomey, you know, I, don't know how many red jerseys he has a whole a whole closet full of them for all the days he's been in red for sure um so it's sometimes like a nice gesture for you know the team leader to let someone else take it if they know they're all going to finish on on the same time uh and he ended up second that year he did yeah i did the vuelta twice with Froomey. yeah one year he was like riding really well he crashed out and then yeah he was second second that year behind quintana um so i gotta ask you about and this is all going to be a great big circle here. Uh, 2018 Tour de France. Mm-hmm. It was your start. Were you were you still on Team Sky then? No, I was at Katusha uh, Alpecin at that point. So it was the first uh, year I had left Katusha. Yeah, so I was at Sky for five years, and kind of because you know the team kept, I guess, progressing so much at Sky. You know, I was like, I need, to, I want to ride the Tour de France, and like it just became harder and harder to like get into that team, um, and so. Yeah, after the 2017 season, I left left Sky and went to Katusha because I was like, I really want to ride, I really want to ride the tour, and it you know it was possible at at Alpecin. Um, well, uh, that brings me to, um, and not knowing if you're on Katusha or Sky at that point, I didn't do that much research. Um, uh, freaking Garrett Thomas won, Froomey was third, uh, and uh, Garrett won the Alpe d'Huez. And I know the Alpe d'Huez, I read an article from, uh, I don't know, a dozen years ago about how like the look, Lance mm-hmm. Armstrong's, the look was a big inspiration for you as you were growing up and riding your bike. And, uh, and here you are on the Alpe d'Huez, uh, Garrett Thomas is, uh, going for yellow Froomey's there. Um, and, and here you are in the Tour de France with uh, um, on that very stage in that yeah. very place. Do you remember, first of all, what did the look mean to you, for you? And by the look, I'm talking, all you have to do is go to YouTube and type Lance Armstrong T for the. Yeah, I'll come up. <laughs> it, the look pops up, yeah. yeah. And it was freaking classic. It was one of my uh st- i used to teach spin class and i was always like and armstrong how's a look back at ulrich as if to say i'm having a go are you yeah. coming or not and the answer is not um so it's it's a classic moment in all of tour de france history um do you remember where do you remember going by that place when you rode that stage Oh goodness, I don't know exactly. I assume it happened lower on. Uh, it was lower I mean, on for sure. Yeah, I mean the, the the crazy thing is like that looks, you know, because I did some recons of Alpe d'Huez um, before the tour with with Elner Zakarum. We had a Russian my teammate, I guess, who I think he found he found a finished ninth in that tour. Um, so I was helping him, you know. So we did we did Alpe d'Huez two or three times, like in in a recon camp. Um, and Alpe d'Huez looks completely different when there's no people. When there's I'm no sure. people, like this is just like a big highway up to the top of the hill. Like where the heck are we going? But when you're in the race and you really don't get to experience that until race day um, and you can't really see where you're going. You don't really know. I mean, you know, there's because if you ride on a normal day, there's signs. Cool. You're nine K to go. And the next kilometer is at eight percent. And there's plaques at every turn of, you know, previous winners on race day. It's like it's so noisy. There's so much, you know, chaos and just fans on the side of the road. You're just like, OK, like I'm just I'm just going to try to make sure to not run into someone and get to the top. Um but I mean, it, it's still kind of looking back on that now, I guess that was what, six years ago now, five years ago um, that I did it. You know, it, it's almost surreal that I did that. You know, I've been over to the tour the last two summers to to do some journalism, journalism and some podcast stuff. And it's like, 
I still feel like a kid, you know, all those memories of like, you know, watching the tour as a kid come back, like, Oh, this is, you know, the Galibier or the Tourmalet, like, Oh, this is, you know, it's, you, it, it's super cool to like feel like that again. But when you're in it, it's kind of, you're just, you're so focused and it's so much of your job. And like, yeah, the fact that, you know, you're riding next to Froomey or Garrett Thomas or, you know, Cavendish, all these icons of the sport, it doesn't really resonate. You know, they're just, they're just people at the end of the day. Um, so you're just like, cool. These are just my colleagues. And we're, you know, the breakaway has gone. We're at the back of the bunch, you know, drink, having a drink of water, taking a nature break, you know, whatever it is, it, they're just your, your friends. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, in, in the course of time, you know, people become legends of, of the sport. And, you know, it's, it's almost like I see a lot of those riders who I know really well. You know, Froome a great example. I hung out with him a couple of weeks ago, I guess, yeah, a month ago um, down in Miami. And, you know, we're just like, we just picked it up where we left off. We're just buddies. But then like, you know, I watch a YouTube video through me. I'm like, Oh man, like what, like what a stud, but it's like, you know, there's almost like two different people you see, you know, your friend and then, you know, someone who's this sporting icon. Yeah. Who's that guy on TV I'm watching. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, what was it like? Uh, of course, Paul Sherwin and Phil Liggett are uh, legends in the, um, uh, you know, call in the race world. Um, and, uh, you know, it was those two calling Armstrong's look, uh, you know, back to Ulrich. And then you're in the tour or the Giro or Vuelta and, uh, they're saying your name. How's that feel? What's that like for you? Yeah. I mean, it's still, I mean, in the intro of my podcast, I think it's Paul Sherwin who like is, you know, give me a shout out. I think at tour of California, he was commenting on it. Um, I think it's, they're it's, both in there, which yeah, I think is cool. And I'm like, yeah, uh, these guys obviously meant something to him to be yeah. in the intro to his podcast. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think just, you know, I think for a lot of American fans, the, the fact that you have, you know, uh, you know, a foreign accent commenting on the race gives it this whole element of, you know, it, it's like this distant thing, you know, it's like, Oh, well, like, you know, people don't speak like that here, you know, even though they're speaking English and you can understand, but just these little like, you know, terms that they use that are, you know, different, you know, they're speaking, you know, with British English. Um, it just adds this kind of like mystique to the whole sport, you know? And I think that's part of the reason why you even look at, you know, this year's tour coverage of, um, I think with NBC, you know, they brought in Sam Bewley, um, who's Kiwi. And it's like, it just, it adds that little bit of like, you know, oh, wow, this is like, where is this happening? Like this person's on, I can understand what he's saying, but it just sounds a little bit different. Um, and I think for the American audience, that's super important. I mean, maybe less so for the, you know, the diehard fans who like just want to know like every single stat and, you know, they, they want to know the intricacies of the race. But you think for, you know, that, you know, cycling fan who just tun- turns in for the tour once a year and that's all the they watch, you know, they, they tune into it because, you know, the, the camera shots of, you know, the vineyards or the castles and, you know, the people on the mountain and to, you know, hear different voices, it really just adds some like character to the whole, you know, whole event. It does. You do got to give uh, Bob roll credit for knowing every freaking castle that they fly over. Like yeah. I'm always impressed that he's like, Oh, and that was, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so was beheaded there or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I'm always impressed by that, but he's fully American and, and yeah. announcing the yeah. Tour de France. Yeah, <laughs> I love Bob Keith. Um, was there a highlight to your fond memory of your time in the World Tour? Something um, you miss? Yeah, man, a lot of fond memories. I mean, I think riding the Tour like is the one thing now that like really stands out. And I think especially as you know, I did three Vueltas, a Giro, a Tour, you know, pl- plenty of other, you know, big races. But I think the Tour is just, it's it's something that, like, I guess I still hang on to. You know, it's, it's one thing that, you know, people ask me, oh, yeah, I used to race professional cycling. Oh, did you do the Tour de France? Like, oh, yeah, actually, I did do the Tour de France. Um, it's the one thing that I think was kind of like an underlying goal throughout my whole cycling career. You know, from the first time I saw it on TV when I was, I don't know, nine or ten years old until making it there. Um, you know, of course, when you're young, you think you're going to win the thing and then you get closer to it and you realize, cool, I just want to make the team. And then it's like, cool, now we're finished. Um, I think that's probably like still the the highlight of just, you know, setting a goal as a child, Hey, I want to ride in the tour de France. And to do that, you know, was probably still the biggest, you know, accomplishment and just kind of thing that, you know, really kind of drove me throughout my entire road cycling career. 
That's pretty awesome. Uh, do you get a ring, like Super Bowl ring? You should get a ring. Uh, you do get, I think when you start, you get like a little M, like a, there's like a little gold, um, it's not a coin, but like a, yeah, a little trophy that has like the route kind of engraved on it. Um, I have that somewhere. I mean, it, it wasn't like, it, I mean, a ring would be cooler or I don't know, a belt buckle, but that's not very, not very French to do a big cowboy belt buckle. <laughs> That'd be kind of funny, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's reserved for Leadville. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm curious. I know you, uh, it was through 2018. Was that your last year in the world tour? Uh, I did like, I raced in the spring of 2019 and that's when I had okay. my, a pretty bad crash. Yeah. Uh, was, was that the impetus for your retirement? What was the impetus? What was the, the full impetus for your retirement? And I've got a broader kind of question for that. Yeah. So in, in the spring of 2019, I was still at Katusha, you know, kind of on track again to like return to the, you know, return to the tour. And, you know, we had a, you know, again, Ilner Zacharin, who was a, you know, a, an outside chance of a podium, but, you know, still a contender. Um, but yeah, I had a crash and had a, a pretty severe concussion and like TBI. And I'd had a number of concussions throughout my cycling career. Um, and recovery took a long time. And I guess at that time, you know, my wife and I were getting married that year. I kind of like came to the decision very much of like, you know, do I want to keep racing? Cause if I keep racing on the road, like I'm going to crash again. Like that's just, that's the reality sure. of it. Um, or have I, am I ready to try something new? And, you know, have I kind of ticked all the boxes as well? You know, I think having ridden the tour the year before was like, what, you know, of course, yeah, you want to get more results, but like, that was such a big accomplishment in a sense. Um, only looking back on it, that it was very much a case of, Hey, you know what? Like you, very few athletes have the opportunity to like stop their career when they want to. Oftentimes you're kind of forced out. Um, and it was very much a choice that I was like, you know what, like maybe it is time that I, you know, hang up my racing wheels and, and move on to something else. And yeah, it wasn't an easy decision to come to, but it was very much my decision. You know, I had opportunities and offers from other teams to, to race another year and, you know, sign a couple, couple contracts with different teams to, to kind of do what I did. Um, but I decided that, you know what, like I, I've had such a good career, like, and I've, you know, kind of done everything I wanted to do and it was time to, yeah, try something else. Did you have a fallback plan? Did you have a alternative somewhere to go? No, not at all. You know, I never went to college. Um, so I, I really didn't know. And I think that's like something that a lot of, I think athletes in general struggle with, especially people who For pursue sure. it as a career, you know, and at the time I was 28 and that was kind of a, a dilemma that I had, you know, I'm 28 years old and I've like accomplished my life goal, you know, from age 10 <laughs> to that point. Right. It's like I had my only goal in life was like to be the best cyclist I was going to be and like, I got to that level more or less, you know? Um, and then it's like, well, now what do I do? Like, what do I look forward to? Like, what am I chasing? What am I like waking up? Let's get me out of bed in the morning. Um, but you also like realize to appreciate different things, you know, like I really, our house here in Vermont, I got really into like, you know, gardening and we have an old farmhouse. Things are always breaking. So like you start to find satisfaction, like, cool. I learned how to do some plumbing projects. Cool. I can like, you know, fix the fence. I learned how I got a tractor. Like, cool. I learned how to like replace, you know, the oil filter on my tractor or do a hydraulic flush, like all these little things that were, you know, no one cares about, like I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> no one's watching you on TV. No one's commenting on, you know, how you, you don't feel like it. Yeah, exactly. But it, it was equally rewarding. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was very much like a personal journey. Um, but something that I don't, I, you know, I look at pro racing now and friends who are still in there and I, I don't, I respect what they do. I admire it, but I don't, I don't at all miss it or think that I should have kept racing another couple of years. Uh, no FOMO. No, no. Well, I can't help, but I got to ask, I, I know Armstrong, I mean, he crushed all of us in 2013 on Oprah. Um, and he was a, a guy you really looked up to. I mean, all those freaking guys, uh, Tyler and Joy, all of them were, uh, were doping, which, makes it a level playing field, right? Could be the argument. Um, but I can't help but wonder, you don't really hear much about performance enhancement, enhancing drugs anymore. Um, but all about the same time, Finney in 2018, Stetna in 2019, uh, Lawrence Ten Dam was having a successful road career in 2019. 
was it because you were fed up with what other people were doing? Like, do you are performance enhancing drugs still prevalent in that world? I mean, like, are people that, getting away without of it? I mean, nothing that I saw. I mean, I think you know we've there. You know, I think people will always like look for an advantage in in sport. You know, there's still like randomly you'll see a you know a positive case will come up and some. But I mean, very seldom is it like the top riders anymore. You know, and I guess with just the the bio passport system and more just the culture around sport, I think is what's changed the most. Um, there's not a culture within teams like, Oh, if we're not doping, we're not going to win. You know, I was at sky and you know, I spent plenty of time. 1%. With and, yeah. And I, and I didn't, you know, I didn't see any like, you know, nefarious actions being taken place or, you know, pills taken or, you know, inject. Like, I mean, I never encountered that during my career. So I think it was like a culture of like, Hey, like, the cream's going to rise to the top, like put your head down, work, you know, kind of go through the process. Um, but it is interesting to kind of, you know, there was this uh, almost generation of riders that often, I mean, I guess you could look at it kind of ended their careers early myself, Finney, you know, even Talansky to a degree. Um, I, and I think that's almost to be attributed to the lack of doping and the fact that because riders became, you know, riders were doing it clean, which, means you had to work that much harder. You know, things all of a sudden did matter. You know, your sleep mattered, your training mattered, your body weight mattered. You know, people weren't using supplements to offset their lack of work, um, which means you're investing more in your sport, which oftentimes leads to a higher burnout rate when you're, uh, you know, yeah. when you're 350 days a year, you're like, you know, watching what you eat, you're training, you're going to bed early, you're sacrificing, you know, family holidays and, you know, birthdays because you're like you're head down um i think you see a higher burnout rate and, and people will say oh yeah but you know the riders now are doing even you know they're more focused than my generation was um but i think that is also you're attracting a different crop of riders to the current generation you know my generation kind of was this transitional generation between the the doping era not saying that those riders didn't work hard but there were shortcuts to be taken to like cool i can you know I can, you know, mess around a little bit in the winter and then, you know, I can get serious and I can go on a doping program and I'll be ready for the tour. Right. You know, my generation kind of had the influence of like the on off switch of the previous generation where it's like, Hey, let's have, you know, Ulrich, well, let's put on, you know, 20 kilos in the winter and, you know, I'll start training in January. The new generation, you know, they don't, they don't take a day off. You know, they're always thinking of, you know, they're measuring food. They're, you know, checking their, you know, blood glucose, they're doing body core temperature, all these things but that's what they signed up for, you know? So they're like, they know that from day one of being on the first junior team, that this is what a pro cyclist looks like. My generation to a degree was like kind of caught between the two. Yes. We had the technology. We, we, you know, a lot of us grew up in the early days of power meters and, you know, coaching, you know, specific training plans, but also, you know, I look when I first went to team sky, you know, we had someone like Bernie Eisel or Matt Heyman, you know, who kind of were from this older generation who brought in like, Hey, no, the race is over. We're all going to go out and have a bunch of beer tonight, which the new generation doesn't do that. So we were kind of like split between like, you know, well, we, we were told we were going to have all this fun and be a pro rider, but now we're being pushed to, you know, they're tracking our sleeping and our eating and our training. Um, so I think that's probably been a huge reason of why there was a crop, especially of North Americans, um, that had this kind of like burnout at a, maybe people would say like a, earlier in their career than was to be expected yeah oh that's a great explanation i'm glad i asked that um and i'm asking a guy who was on the inside as a fan you're skeptical yeah. you know and I, i'm a fan from the you know 80s and 90s when everybody was doping and it was just kind of known and who could not get caught oh freaking festina uh, festina team yeah. you know i mean that's the era i grew up um, as a fan in, and, uh, you always wonder, you know, you see, uh, Matthew Vanderpool just freaking ride away from the best cyclocross guys in the world. You see Wout Van Aert just ride away and you're like scratching your head, but yeah. it sounds like there's a, a culture where, well, team sky kind of brought it in where you change your habits for that 1%. Yeah. Yeah, and then when when you do that, you know the the best athletes are always going to stand out. You know when you look at right. you know Michael Jordan or Usain Bolt right. or you know I mean maybe not the best example, but you know there, there's athletes that like someone has to be the best. You know some people yep. are just you know have an ability you know both physically and mentally to put in the work that you know they can one you know handle it. 
but then to like perform on you know on race day i think that's a huge thing that people discount is there's you know there's a lot of people out there that could you know do a 20 minute power test and like come close to pogachar you know phil guyman's a great example you know put him on a climb with someone and he's gonna like you know on his given day he's gonna like perform pretty close to the top but you you know go to a race and it's just it, it's just a case of you know there's so many different you know non-measurable things that you know you can't that makes i guess the the greats great and everyone else you know <laughs> look after is trying is exactly. trying to catch them yeah huh yeah that's uh i respect that i think that's uh gives me a new light when watching yeah. all the stuff i i watch and enjoy um, okay, so let's talk about uh, are you you're back in Vermont. Um, you are uh, fixing the um, hydraulics on your new tractor. You're planting, I don't know, carrots and tomatoes and such. Um, how'd you end up at Wahoo? And well, how'd you end up at Wahoo? I have yeah. a follow up to that. Yeah, well, so I, I, uh, I guess I became familiar with Wahoo in 20, I guess it was the winter of 2013. They came on as a sponsor of team sky, you know, I guess the first with, with the kicker trainer, which kind of like, you know, sky actually went out and was like, Hey, we need, we need these trainers because, you know, riders can't miss a day of training. Um, and not everyone lives in, you know, Southern California. So, uh, yeah, I just became familiar with, with the brand. And I guess a lot of the people at the time, because it was relatively small who worked there, you know, chip, chip Hawkins, who, um, is the you know the founder and at the time was also like acting ceo also just being you know an american rider on a british team you know you'd come to training camp to, you know talk about the products and like you know we just kind of connected because you know we we're one of i was i guess one of two americans on the team as myself and, and dimbrowski um and then you know throughout my whole career they sponsored sky the whole time i was there and then they also were a sponsor of katusha when i was there so i was just always you know always kind of in touch with with the the team over at Wahoo, you know, doing additional, you know, testing or kind of giving them feedback on products. And then when I decided that I was going to leave uh, the world tour, you know, I talked to some people at Wahoo, just like told them, Hey, I'm leaving. They're like, actually, we might have a position that you can fill if you're interested. We know you don't have a degree in marketing or anything, but um, the company was growing and there was kind of this void of who was going to manage kind of the relationships with athletes and teams. And, you know, I, had been an athlete. Um, I still had a lot of relationships and connections. And so I, I kind of slotted into this role that was in a sense made, well, wasn't a role, but was kind of made for me. And I've just kind of grown within the company from there. Yeah. I was going to say, you actually do have a college degree in exactly that. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But and I mean, and I guess there's a certain degree of um, benefit that I've brought just because like, I'm not starstruck if I speak to a, you know, it's like, cool, this is for like, sure. Like, I'm not going to be asking, oh, so what do you have? Like, I just like, what do you need? Like, just let me know yeah, what products you yeah, need or what yeah. feedback you have. And uh, what do we need to troubleshoot? Or like, you know, what, you know, what can we do to get you the best products we can? And um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been an amazing learning experience. I guess I'm going into my fifth year now, which is crazy to think about. Yeah. Uh, you're like old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that kind of led you to gravel, I understand. Yeah, it did. I mean, so at the time, I guess this was 2020, um, you know, I had left the world tour, you know, I'd kind of thought, cool, I'm not going to, not going to race anymore, but I still really loved riding my bike. Um, I guess that was what I discovered in 2019 throughout the rest of the year, kind of recovering from that concussion was how much I missed riding my bike. And I just missed, you know, the, the freedom to go explore. And, you know, at the time, and I guess still, you know, Wahoo was a partner of, you know, various gravel events, you know, they sponsored some gravel athletes and, um, like, Hey, you know, we're going to go to these gravel events and you're likely because you're working with the athletes going to be someone who's going to be, you know, attending the events, you know, helping athletes beforehand or, you know, just working in the booth. You might as well ride the event because during the middle of the event, you know, there's no one in the expo, you know, sure. You might expo as well shuts part- down. Yeah, exactly. You might as well participate. So I was like, cool. I'll, you know, this sounds great. I can go and, you know, ride in Kansas or I can go ride in SBT or BWR. Um, but, you know, then the pandemic happened. And so, you know, during 2020, I didn't, I didn't race, <clears throat> I didn't race at all. So from, I guess the spring of 2019 until the spring of 2021, I didn't race a bike, you know, I still rode and I wouldn't say I specifically trained, but I just kind of really fell in love again with just going out and riding my bike, whether it was an hour or five hours, you know, jumping on the, the kicker in my basement, just, just staying fit and like, you know, kind of being a normal, <laughs> normal, normal, yeah. Individual I was going to say, you sound like us. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you sound like the um, rest of us who just love riding bikes, and that's what we do. Yeah, but I guess I kind of just caught this like confluence of the sport growing, and you know, I guess in twenty twenty one, you know, Unbound was the second ever gravel race I did, and it, you know, I went there not really knowing at all what to expect, um, and yeah, lo and behold, it was the the second gravel race I did, and somehow um uh, i guess I, I i won the thing which I, I i didn't really anticipate beforehand um you know i knew i was like had you know some decent fitness and stuff but an event like that is just so unique that it wasn't something that i was thinking i could just rock up to and and you know kind of beat the best riders in the world at that discipline you 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 had a wife i assume you had a car you had a house Mm-hmm. You had, did you have a kid in 21? Hold your I did not. No, but by the time so Unbound. So no kid. No, but I knew my wife was pregnant at Unbound. Okay. I don't know if that counts or not. <laughs> yeah, um, you don't know what's coming yet. And a job. Um, we used to have the five evils of bike racing. And you yeah. had just about all five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and you show up and you freaking win. And there's guys who like dedicate their lives to competing on dirt, whether it's gravel stuff, long stuff like a Leadville, um, and Unbound. Unbound was kind of this weird 200 mile odyssey thing for a long time. It certainly wasn't uh, what it is today for sure. Um, did you piss people off when you are like, Oh, I got a job and a house and a wife and a, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've made it pissed anyone off. I mean, I think if anything, it probably like it, it, in a way it like devalued everything for me. If that makes sense. Like I went, I was just like, cool. Like, I don't like, it doesn't matter if I win or lose. Like I'm not going to, you know, quit my job and go back to full-time racing. Like there was no pressure, you know, like, like, holy, like there's a couple of times I was like, what the heck? Like I'm, there's five people left in the front group. How am I here? Like, it was more of like, I kept surprising myself that I was like, Whoa, I, you know, I shouldn't be here. Like, I know, as you said, I've got four of the five evils. Why am I, why am I in the front group? Right. Um, but, and I, and I guess that was kind of part of the magic of it was it was, I was just, I was doing it cause it was fun. And like, because I wanted to do it, not because it was, you know, my job, not because, you know, my livelihood depended on it. It was very much like, this is a personal, um, a personal endeavor that I just enjoy riding my bike and it's fun to ride your bike fast with, with strong people. And, you know, 2021 was so unique as well because the, the front group that we eventually kind of got away, um, it was a group of people that I also knew really well and so, well, I mean, most, you know, I guess it wasn't, there wasn't some random riders in there that I didn't know their names or where they're from. You know, I, I'd known everyone in that front group, which was made it even kind of more, just felt like a big group ride with strong people that with was your friends. a really, a really long ride. Yeah. Uh, who might've been in there? Like, uh, so uh, it was Stetna. Yeah. Stetna, myself, uh, Ted King, Lawrence Ooh, right. Tendam and Colin Strickland were the five of us up there. Oh, geez. I mean, that's a stellar group right there. It was a strong group. Yeah. I mean, at one point, I, I think it was like before the last aid station, which was what, I don't know, 60 miles to go. I was like, you guys, let's, this is such a cool like day out on the bikes. Like, why don't we just all come to the finish line together? Like, we don't need to have a winner. Why don't we just all come, you know? And then sure enough, people started attacking. I was like, okay, I'll follow the attack. And then it was, you know, me and Pete and Lawrence. Then it was just me and Lawrence. And I was like, Okay, I mean, I guess we'll. <laughs> what are we gonna do here? And it's like a stop sure. ahead sign. You're not gonna not sprint for it, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Huh. That's fun. Uh, how did uh, 2022 pan out? You got third behind two of the freaking kings of the sport right now. Yeah. yeah I mean, once again, I mean, a bit of a surprise. You know, obviously by that point I'd had a kid. You know, and I guess with the success that I had in 21, um, and I, I guess the lack of personal pressure or ambition all that kind of uh sensation of being like a pro rider came back like you know all of a sudden you know people like oh well you won last year you could win again so like all these kind of you know experiences of being a pro athlete came back of like oh well you know what are you going to do this year um and so i I would say i'm i was more proud of my ride in 2022 um just because you know i i guess there was i i knew that it was you know this was a really hard race to win um, and you know, the first year was almost kind of beginner's luck to a degree. And, you know, I had a flat early on in 22, um, 
you know, in the first like 20 miles and came back from that. And just like more than anything, you know, there was more, I had more pressure on myself for whatever reason, because I knew I was capable of winning to like try to repeat and, and, you know, have a good performance once again. Um, well, congratulations. Were you yeah. like, uh, I don't want to feel this way. This is why I left. Um, I mean, not, re- I mean, I, I really enjoy the process. Um, but, and, and I guess it's, I, it's funny that like unbound is, you know, it's such a chaotic event from just a standpoint of it's so long, you know, you're, you know, the eating, the drinking, you know, the mechanical issues that can arise, but it's still oddly the one event that like interests me. I think just because it's so, it's so personal, you know, and, and so much of my bike career had external factors, you know, you have team orders, you have, you know, all these things that you can't really control, you know, other teams and, and unbound is still, yes, you are racing. And, and every year it does become, you know, the front group that we're going to the finish with becomes bigger. You know, the first year is that I did, it was, you know, me and Lawrence. And then it was a group of five of us. This last year is a group of seven of us. So you are racing your competition, but it's still such a personal, um, you know, you make all these personal choices of like, you know, how are you going to do the aid stations? What are you going to carry with you? You know, how do you, what tire pressure do you want to use? How, how are you going to train and prepare for it? It really just stands on its own of like the decisions you make dictate, I think your performance a lot more than the decisions that other riders make who you're competing against. Uh, That makes sense. Do you today work out ride with Kansas in mind. Do you have a training plan uh, no, you follow, or do you no, just ride your no, bike? No, I don't have time for a training plan. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I know that like I know the event is coming up, but it's like it, you know at the moment it's it's January. I've got a kid coming in, a new a second child coming in a couple of weeks. It's like more or less just trying to like not get too out of shape, you know. So <laughs> uh, with the weather we have here, you know, it's whether I'm Nordic skiing or whether I'm in the basement riding the kicker. Um, you know, it's just trying to stay fit enough so when like spring comes i can be ready to to ride more but even then i, I don't really follow a well i don't follow a training plan i go for some some of my own koms and then do some long rides and you know, i guess that's the other thing with unbound is that it's such a drawn out event um for me personally i don't think like the specific like being super specific doesn't really make a big difference it's just like building up a big a big engine um ahead of time and like i said just kind of working on those details the, the eating the drinking um you know, on those long rides. You sound kind of like one of us. Oh, and like, I feel like, I mean, also I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't choose to live in the best location for training. You know, oftentimes like April and May in Vermont. Are unless still, you have a Wahoo kicker. Yeah. Are still springtime. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, and I, and I guess like that's where I'm kind of at now. Like you know, there's certain, I haven't set like, you know, kind of parameters or, you know, set bumpers on like what I'm able to, sacrifice to perform you know I, I still obviously i was just in texas riding so you know i left my wife and daughter for a week to go ride there but um that's as much just like personal enjoyment as it is is training you know i still my wife understands that i still get a lot of satisfaction out of just riding my bike and sometimes you know that's not always possible long rides here in, in vermont this time of year yeah for sure i can totally see that so i want to tie this all you you have become one of the um uh I don't know, stars in U.S. gravel, on the U.S. gravel scene, um, accidentally, <laughs> um, a little bit. But um, I know that, uh, Kyle, Gravel Locos, uh, that dude is so nice, so cool. Yeah. And I'm, I asked him, I was like, how, like, how did your race end up on people's radar? And he's mm-hmm. like... I invited Ian Boswell and he invited his <laughs> friends and his friends showed up and then more friends showed up and they invited their friends. Uh, what was it about that race that attracted you to it? Did you know Fabian before you ended up there or did no, you No, like... I, I, I didn't. So in 2021, um, I did a couple of weeks prior to unbound was the rule of three gravel mm-hmm. race down in, in Bentonville, Arkansas. So I went to that because I, you know, I had a friend going, I was like, cool, I'll go to that. This, that was the same weekend as Rule of Three, which I didn't, or sorry, as Gravel Locos. And I had never heard about, you know, I was new to gravel. So I was just like kind of going off what people told me. And, you know, the that year, you know, I think Ted Dam and Ted King and a few other riders went to Gravel Locos. And I think it was like 
300 people or something. Yeah. Um, I didn't know Fabian, you know, I was very much a kind of a, on the periphery of, of the gravel scene. Um, but I met Fabian at the, after the finish of 2021 unbound when I won, he had his RV there and, uh, he was friends with Lawrence Tendam and Tendam's like, Hey, like this, you know, my friend Fabian's cooking up some steak and shrimp. And so I was like, cool, I'll go. It was right at the finish line. He had his RV there. So he, you know, had some beers and so ate he some bribed food. you. Uh, no, I mean, I was, I was hungry. I just ridden 10 hours. <laughs> I would have been there. I'm I like, I'll talk about your race for <laughs> yeah. freaking steak and shrimp um, and beer. Yeah. I'm but in. He's like, hey, yeah, but he's like, hey, well, you want to come down to my event in, in Texas next year? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I, you know, really had no, I mean, that was 11 months from, you know, when we were talking. I was right. like, don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, we did, you know, he, he invited me down. And it's also like, it really is, I mean, it's become a big race in its own right. You know, if you win Gravel Locos, it's, you know, kind of makes your season. Um, but it is like also the best preparation i think for for unbound you know especially for someone like myself coming from vermont you know you get the heat you get you know a long hard fast race you know two weeks before unbound um you know every year it's attracted more kind of talent um prior to unbound you know whether it's international riders you know nicholas roach was there last year and peter vatkoff and you know tendam brings his whole you know dutch armada um so it really is it's the perfect perfect event to like just get ready for unbound it's also i mean it's cool to see you know just being there in heiko a couple of weeks ago it's just it's crazy to see that like you know this event has come to this small town that doesn't really have a cycling culture you know i was out midweek i was there for four days before the weekend i didn't see one other cyclist out riding and yet they're super friendly to cyclists you know they're super welcoming to the event and also just how much an event like gravel locos can also transform the town and i'm sure you spoke to fabian about you know, what he does for the fire department there, which was another draw for me is, you know, I'm on our local fire department, volunteer fire department here in, in my town in Vermont. Um, and he's like, yes, you know, we raised all this money for, you know, the fire department, they bought a couple of new trucks and like every year they're, you know, expanding. I'm like, that's really cool. Like I'd be happy to come support that. Um, but Fabian just does, I mean, he does a great job of, you know, looking after all the riders, which I think is, it's super important to me. You know, he treats the, the, you know, pro elite riders, you know, better than any event you know just helping us out with you know organizing some meals you know so for everyone to just get together you know that's the the funny thing with these gravel events is you know i'm always getting texts or texting friends like oh yeah let's hang out at the race and like you never see him everyone's running around trying to right. you know find their hotel get food but fabian's like hey guys like i've sorted out a meal on whatever the friday night before the event so like you actually get to hang out with you know these people who you want to talk to off the bike but you just never get a chance to um, so it's cool that, you know, the, the elite riders get that opportunity, but equally, you know, Fabian stays out there until the last rider finishes. There's no cutoff, you know, people have finished at 1am and Fabian's out there with his friends oh, waiting wow. for them to cross the finish line. Um, which is cool to me. It really embodies, I guess, for me, uh, like what gravel is now and what it's like, what it should, I'll say remain as, but like that it is this huge spectrum of like, yes, the, the elite pro you know, riders are going to keep getting faster and take it more seriously. But there are thousands of other riders participating who are just out there to ride bikes with their friends and want to make it to the finish line and not be taken off course. And if it takes them eight hours or 16 hours, like Fabian's going to wait out there for you to finish. Um, and largely because like he, and I guess he would admit this, like that would, that's him, you know, he's done mm -hmm. plenty of events where like he has been the last finisher and everyone's gone. There's no food left. Like, and he's like this, why did I just pay? 180 bucks and i'm here by myself right um, the level of support he provides and i guess i see it from from my side and i saw this at the the ride he put together in um heiko on new year's morning with myself and emily you know there was like maybe 40 or 50 people showed up for this ride he organized you know three four different three different routes like a 30 mile a 60 mile and a 100 mile and then he had follow cars for all of them. He had aid station. And this was just a free ride that people could show up to, you know, and a couple of people had, you know, mechanicals or they just weren't feeling good. He's like, hey, here's this number, give me a call and we'll have someone come pick you up. I'm like, he's just doing this because he knows what it's like to be in that situation of like, it sucked. It was like for people in Texas, it was a cold, windy day. And they're like, I don't feel good. Like, you know, I just want to get back to the start finish. He had cooked hot dogs and hamburgers for everyone. Um, so it's really just that sense of caring for not just the elite riders, but for all riders and like making sure that everyone feels welcome at, at his events. And I think he's done a really good job of that because he, he knows more than anyone what it feels like to, to not be welcomed home after a hard ride. That must just be a Texas thing. We went to the rattlesnake 
gravel grind in March and they had a shakeout ride on Friday afternoon and it was freaking supported. We had a follow yeah. car. We had a lead car. It was free. Yeah. Well, and I think I'm also like, people in I've... Texas don't mind driving. Everything's, everything's two hours <laughs> away. Enough. So like, cool, if I have to spend 30 minutes to come pick you up, no problem. You yeah, know? that may be the case. But uh, we were blown away by that kind of hospitality. Yeah. That hasn't happened to any other race I've done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like even better support than some of the races I've done. Yeah. And it was just a shakeout ride. It was awesome. So that, I wonder if that's just a, a Texas thing or David King is uh, friends with Fabian. So maybe it's a, yeah, maybe they just good people hang out together too. I yeah, don't know. Yeah, it could be. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also, it, it's cool to, you know, in this, uh, I guess, age or space and gravel where like, you know, everyone's like signing up, you know, races are consolidating there you know there's more series and stuff that like fabian's like becoming more of just an island of like hey this is my event and i'm going to do it the way that i want it to be and yeah. i also have like a lot of respect for that that he's not you know he's not trying to fit into the mold of what other events are he's just doing he's doing it his way the way he wants to do it and i have a lot of respect for that because it's it's it really is a, a way that you know i admire that you know allows the fastest riders to have a great race, but allows the participants to, you know, feel safe and supported throughout. Yeah. Uh, Mid-May, right? Uh, Mid-May. Yeah. Two, I think the 18th or something. Yeah. I was going to say the 19th, but it must be that weekend. Yeah. 18, 19. Um, so I definitely would encourage people to check that out and head on down to Heiko for uh, Gravel Locos. Yeah. So I want to talk to you. We've been on for, 54 minutes and 53 seconds. Uh, but I want to for sure ask you about your podcast. Um, how did that start? And I don't know, is breakfast a thing for you? Uh, I, well, it's actually not a long story, but so back when I was growing up racing, there used to Velo News, which no, I guess it's Velo now. They used to have this like daily uh, article. It's called Breakfast with Bernie, which was it was with Bernie Eisel. Oh, um, sure. Essentially, it was just like a check-in. Like I think every day during the tour, they just did like a hey, like Bernie, like you know maybe what do you have for breakfast, but what's coming up in today's stage, and you know what's your goal, what is it, how's the team feeling, just like a short, it was like a daily article. Um, in the 2018 tour, my buddy came over to the tour to kind of follow along. He's like, Hey, we should do this daily podcast and call it breakfast with Boz. Um, so we did that. And, uh, I don't know if you can still find the episode somewhere that you probably could dig around the internet, but they were just like a 15 minute daily podcast from the 2018 tour. Um, of just my buddy and I in the start village, you know, talking about what was coming up, you know, the night before this, you know, what was happening in the race. Um, and that was kind of the end of it. You know, we did it in the 2018 tour and then, it stopped. And then in 2020, when I joined Wahoo, um, one of my friends there was like, Hey, like, you know, what happened to breakfast with Boz? Like, do you have any interest in, in starting to, you know, kind of bringing the podcast back? And I was like, yeah, I actually really, I really enjoyed it. You know, podcasts were, you know, becoming more, more commonplace. Um, and so, yeah, since 2020, I've been, yeah, breakfast with Boz has been, been back and, and, and I guess it's kind of always the same, um, theme i mean it's not always cycling i guess you know there's oftentimes mm -hmm. i speak to triathletes or runners or you know some done triathletes stuff. or cyclists too yeah that's true yeah <laughs> bike fitters or you know uh, you know all sorts of different kind of endurance sports focused um and i guess largely just like things that are curious to me and you know topics that i you know find interesting uh i'm not going to ask if you have a favorite episode but was there somebody who surprised you who kind of came out of nowhere or um you know i did a podcast surprise. this last year with uh david miller um because hmm. we spent a lot of i i you know we raced together in, in the world tour and you know we, we knew each other we weren't close but we spent a lot of time together at cape epic um hmm. and kind right. of seen this like transformation of him falling back in love with his bike again um you know i guess this just this past year um so my podcast with him, I, I really enjoyed because it was almost more like a, a therapy session for myself. You know, he's, I don't know, 15 years older than I am, but, you know, just seeing where he's at in his life, realizing like, okay, at some point, you know, I may fall out of love with the sport, but like, you know, you can come back to it and it's, it's going to be completely different. You know, when you're 48, you're not going to go win unbound again. Um, but so personally for me, I really enjoyed just, just speaking. I mean, it was a conversation that we had, um, but it was just happened to be recorded. Hmm, that's awesome. Um, anyone who uh, you were surprised said yes uh, to a request? 
yeah, like Ian Volteri. Boswell on Bike Talk with Dave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I think Volteri Botas was probably the biggest surprise. Um, he's again, it's kind of adjacent to cycling, so he's a professional. He's a Formula One driver. Um, oh right, right. But I'm, I'm friends with his his girlfriend is a pro cyclist who I know pretty yep. well, and they were at SPT. He's this almost summer. a freaking pro cyclist. He's good. He's a good. He is a good rider as well. Yeah. Um, but I was just I was at SPT and I was like out on a little evening cruise and I just texted his girlfriend like, hey, do you think I could get Botas on the podcast tomorrow? And she's like, yeah, swing by our place. And I was like, I was just surprised that he said yes. Um, <laughs> you know, just he's a guy that you know he's got a lot of people asking him a lot of things and for, for his sure. time and that he said yes to that. I was yeah, I was surprised. Well, I I loved that because probably I don't know a week or two before that came out, my son, the one who lives in Austin, he's like, hey man. If you get what I don't even know his name, um, what's his name? Botas. Botas. If you get that Botas, that F one dude who rides bikes, I'll listen. <laughs> yeah, I like, exactly. Yeah. I was, so I forwarded him your episode. I was like, here, yeah. here you go. Yeah. Um, anybody who you dream about getting? Um. Ooh. I, I mean, it probably would never happen. I would. I would love to have like a. I mean, I think it'd be fascinating to interview Lance. I don't For think sure. He, he was it. on like a podcast just... recently. Yeah. Somebody I mean, got I him mean, on a podcast. Yeah, he was actually on, uh, he was on uh, Bill Maher's Club Random as well, which is huh. random. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, I, I saw named. that. Yeah, I saw that and I was like, huh, that's strange. But I mean, I guess just like if we could sit down and have like just a long form conversation about just like his time racing and kind of like, I mean, cause I actually, you know, I raced on his development team in 20, yep. sorry, 2011 and 12. Um, so just to like, I mean, just to yeah, sit down and do something like that would be, would be interesting for me. You had a personal relationship with him to some extent, didn't you? Uh, I mean, probably it was less to him than to me, <laughs> you know, I guess for me, Fair you know, enough. like being on his team, you know, he came to a couple of our team camps and, you know, we went to his house and we were in Texas for a couple of parties and stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I knew him. I mean, if you told him my name, he might recognize it, but I wouldn't say we were, I don't, you know, we're not, I'm not sending him Christmas cards or anything. Um, we do. Have you heard of Ragbri? Yes. I, uh, that is a life goal of mine is to do Ragbri. I can't remember. Oh, come on out. Uh, we'll be, we will be your tour guide. Yeah. hundred percent. We next, know, we yeah. know Ragbri very, very well. I've been going since 84, missed oh, a few wow. years, but uh, I'm definitely Ragbri veteran. Anyway, yeah, we've brought our kids. Um, we brought our kids every year. We had a. Um, this was a year we had a triple with a trailer bike, and a burley, or wow. it might have been two kids on a double trailer bike. But anyway, all five of us were riding, which was we did that every year, yeah. and uh, <laughs> we end up just happenstance like ending up on this wheel three guys i look down i'm like those are some damn nice legs and uh i'm like that's freaking lance armstrong i'm sitting <laughs> on lance armstrong's wheel and he came back and talked to uh, me my wife all three kids he was super gracious so as a result of that he and i are like we trade christmas cards i can't believe you <laughs> yeah. don't <laughs> yeah no that is basically that is, that best is, friends yeah rag bry with the family is definitely uh something i love to do and I don't know, at some point in the next 10 years. All right. I'm going to hold you to that. And if like, I'll, whatever you need, Ragbri is easy to us. Okay. We'll, we'll help you on. The logistics cool. are, are going to be easy for you. Okay. I have one more question and then I'll let you go. And I want to ask you this because you've seen the sport from several different angles in the past 20 years. Uh, from the road, the world tour thing, the gravel thing, you work in the industry. Um, some 12 year old, 14 year old kid loves riding their bike. What would you tell them? What direction would you point somebody today? Um, college kid, 16 year old, uh, who wants to be a professional cyclist? whatever that means. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say my first piece of advice would be pursue it. Like, I mean, because especially, you know, kids who come, you know, 
from, you know, families that, you know, are well to do. It's like, you know, Hey, why are you racing your bike? Go to college, you know, do, you know, that's what I did. That's how we, you know, can afford for you to race your bike. So, you know, do what I did, but like, you can't, you can't go back and I mean, you can go back and race your bike, but you can't go to college and get a, you know, you want to become a doctor and you're 38 and you're like, cool, I want to be a pro. Like you missed the boat. Like, don't, don't miss that window. Um, cause you can't go back. And then my second piece of advice would be like, you know, there's no substitute for hard work. And like, if you think you're working hard, like someone's working harder and, and it's, and that's not, that doesn't mean like go train more, or, you know, but it means like the, the time that you have to like pursue that professional career or that pursuit of it, um, is really short. And, you know, and like, yes, it's important to have some balance, but like, you know, maximize that time. And that doesn't, like I said, not just training more, but like, you know, resting, eating well, like, you know, doing, doing all the little things, right. Like live that lifestyle because, the rest of life is always going to be there when you're done. Um, but you can't necessarily, you know, I, um, like I said, I've got two kids and a job and I can't tell my wife like, Hey, I'm just going to like, you know, go get a massage today and I'm going to lay on the couch and watch Netflix and, you know, oh, I'm going to need a foam roll. Like that just, that's not the reality anymore, but that was my reality because I, you know, I made it my priority. Um, so if it is something you want to pursue, like pursue it with a hundred percent of your focus, cause that's what it takes. Hmm. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I don't know. I'm hitting 60 next year. Maybe I'll be a professional cyclist. It's always Masters Nationals. <laughs> yep. Um, all right, dude. Thanks tons for coming on. Appreciate you uh, taking time out of um, fixing the hydraulics on your tractor, yeah. playing with kids, uh, being a husband, and making breakfast. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate, uh, appreciate your time and loved hearing your stories. Cool. And Thanks so much, Dave. And I would encourage people to, A, tune into Breakfast with Boz and look for you at Gravel Locos and Unbound. Going to Unbound yep. again? I'll be back. I'll be back. All right. Cool. We'll look for you and say hey. Cool. Thanks, Dave. I got to admit, I really enjoyed talking with Ian. I have never met him in person, but he's one of those people who is just friendly and easy to talk to, and he sure tells a good story. I suppose that makes sense with his podcast and all, which you should definitely add to your queue. Breakfast with Boz, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Now, while Gravel Locos is a race that Boz has helped grow, the Core 4 is a race that I enjoy and I would like to invite you to. Who's ready for some Core 4 news? After a huge spike in riders and a super thank you to everyone for coming out this year, these guys jumped right back into the fire. It's no surface untouched again for 2024 because Core 424 has a sweet sound to it, no doubt. New routes, new distances, and a new you. That's right y'all, they are mixing it up with more surprises and delights. New for 24 is the Core 40 distance. Just a bump up from the 20 mile and still has all the farmscapes and B roads and champagne gravel you'd expect from the folks at Core 4, just without the single track. They're telling us 60 is the new 50, miles that is. It's a no surfaced, untouched podium eligible route with all the cats in addition to their marquee 100 mile event. It's the perfect blend of competition and community. We want Core 4 to be on your event calendar for 2024. Jump on Bike Reg today, snag your spot before this event reaches its cap. Come ride the wave and get more bodies on bikes. It's blazing hot action every year and they'll keep the fire stoked all winter long with the 20, 40, 60 or 100 mile route, Core 4 24 has something for everyone. It's time for the next time. Let's go! Maybe we'll see you there. Okay, now my next ad is what I like to call guiltless self promotion. I have formalized what I've been doing freelance for more than a decade and I believe I'm pretty good at it. Multimedia stuff, photography, video, audio. So check out this ad.
Mabel Media, an award-winning film, photography, and podcast company that can help you reach the top. Whether you need a 30-second spot to tell your story on the evening news, photos for next year's catalog, social media clips, or maybe you need your podcast produced and edited, Mabel Media is here for you. With more than a dozen years in media, our resume runs deep. An award-winning feature-length film company, podcast production, live video streaming, and stunning photography, our only objective is to provide you the tools you need to reach the summit. Check it out at MabelMedia.net. So if you do need any photo, video, or audio help, connect with me at MabelMedia.net, and I'd love to help you out. In the meantime, thanks tons for tuning in. I'd love your help in growing this podcast. I've got some fun episodes coming up, like another great storyteller, the host of the Adventure Sports Podcast, Mason Gravely. And if you'd be so kind as to rate and review this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, it will help the show grow. And if you want to support the show financially, just look for Bike Talk with Dave at buymeacoffee.com and drop a few coins in the cup. If you do, I'd love to send you a sticker. I'd like to thank Gustavo and Brian for dropping some coins in the cup and helping me crush a few months of my podcasting expenses. Now, I also have some beanies to help keep your head warm. Just shoot me a DM on Instagram or Facebook at Bike Talk with Dave, and I'll let you know how to get one. And be sure to check out the Bike Talk with Dave channel on YouTube, where you can watch some of our award-winning films, including Thousand Miles to Nome and Down the Kuskokwim. In the meantime, stay warm, enjoy your rides, and remember that nothing compares with the simple pleasure of riding a bicycle, even if it's a blizzard and 15 below.